Welcome everybody to today's lecture. The unit name is Plan and Cost Basic Menus and we will be going through all of the slides today. Um, in between we will take breaks for the activities. Um, once you guys have completed the activities um, feel free to resume the video and come back and we will start again from the next performance criteria. So this unit is about essentially making a simple and basic menu, you know, costing the menu, um, you know, essentially getting you a base for how to plan out and really identify what sort of restaurant you're going to be opening or working for or helping create and what the costings will be just in, in a small time frame and um, your trainer will help you through uh, the finer details. So while I go through it with you on the lecture today, um, the trainer will also help you if you've got any questions. So you can get in touch with your trainers accordingly, all their um, emails are listed on the website, or you can just give us a call if you've got any questions and we'll direct you to the correct personnel. Okay, so let's get started. So identify customer preference, identify current customer profile for the food business um, very important if you don't know what you're selling to who you're selling essentially there's no business you've got no idea on you know who's going to be buying what it's going to be really hard for you to actually make any money so you know when we're identifying our customer profile I really would you know if you're opening your own restaurant or trying to help somebody open theirs I would recommend trying to do some research, doing some surveys on the street, wherever you think you're going to open your restaurant. Stand out there and see how many people are walking by. What sort of people are walking by? What age, gender, you know, you're looking at what are their lifestyles like? Are they married? Do they have kids? Are they single? You know, just by finding out what that means to you, as in, if they're single, most of your plates really need to be a full meal. You can't really sell items where people need to buy multiple things and it's not affordable for one person to do. Where if you, you know, you know mostly finding families in your area, you could have uh, more kid-friendly menu items. So you've got to think about who you're catering to, where they're located, what sort of income they have really. Like if you were creating a menu for a inner west suburb you know you would go for a much cheaper more approachable menu compared to maybe being in a metropolitan city where you would maybe create a much more expensive and more experience based menu um, so it really depends on your location what sort of staff are you gonna have are you gonna have a um, you know, a chef who's really well trained in all sections or are you going to really focus on one type of cuisine? And is that cuisine going to work for you? Let's say if we open an Indian restaurant and that's great, but if we're serving authentic Indian and it's got a lot of spices, it might not be great for a demographic which doesn't like a lot of spice. So yes, maybe they will come and purchase from you, um, but it might not be as often compared to other foods that are less spicy if that is an issue so you've got to think about who you're serving to also with what the location asks for you you know there's no point in opening a fine dining restaurant in the front of a train station as in more of the people around the train station are going by to get to their next destination they're not really coming to you um, you know, bringing their families and sitting down. Maybe they want a coffee, maybe a sandwich, and they're off, you know, they're off into the train. But if you're a location base, you know, you're coming to maybe a specific tourist destination, you might create more of a sit-down kind of experience for your customers. Um, and a lot of, you know, you've got to be thinking about how are you going to be procuring your items that you're going to be selling. So if you maybe like um, you're trying to sell something that's really seasonal, your menu has to be exactly like that seasonal as you can't have it as a fixed item. So 
if you're serving fresh food based on the season, you're always going to have a, a like you're going to have issues where you have to rotate and change up your menu as the seasons come through. Um, and what are your customers expecting? You know, are they really wanting what you're trying to sell them? Maybe there are too many. If, if you're a Thai restaurant trying to open where there are already Thai restaurants around, it might not be, you know, right for you to do that. It might be a detriment to your business. So you might want to go somewhere else where there are no Thai restaurants and allow your business to have a chance instead of having to compete where there are already competing businesses around you. Alright, so for your activity 1A, we've got two questions. Um, what is a target customer? Why is it important to identify your business target customer profile? So a target customer is the person that you're, you know, uh, creating your menu or creating your business around that you're going to sell products to. So if you're basing your business around online delivery, most of these people won't be traveling. So you have to create a business model where your food can be taken from the place of production to where they're located. So you have to create your business around that. So the target customer is essentially who you're trying to sell to. And why it is important to identify your business target uh, customer profile? Well, um, if you don't know who you're going to sell to, then how do you figure out what you need to sell to them? You know, you can't sell ice to an Eskimo. They have a lot of a lot of that. So you need to figure out what don't they have and what can you create that you can charge, you know, money for. So number two, what things will you need to consider when creating a target customer profile? So there was very uh, various, you know, topics that we had talked about before. Uh, some, you know, some could be such as age, gender, um, the lifestyle, um, the income, the location, you know, so there's many others, but give me a, like at least five, then, I, I, then I'll get a gist of that you know what you're talking about. So pause the video right now, finish those questions, and when you're free to uh, restart, come back to the video, and we can go from the next one. Alright, so hopefully you've been able to finish those questions. Let's move on to the next one. So analyze food preferences of customer base. So once you've actually formed out your target customer, now you want to figure out what sort of food you're going to sell them. So, you know, if you're uh, predominantly in a halal area, you wouldn't want to be catering um, to your customers with pork or non-halal products. So you'd really want to do your research if you're in a you know highly um, you know area where vegan uh, lifestyle is prominent you wouldn't want to create a restaurant where it's uh, Texas barbecue and it's based a lot of you know on animal products so you're not going to be making a lot of money where maybe let's say 80% of your customers are vegan so identify who they are okay so that's your very first thing that you want to do okay so um, make sure you're thinking about how they want to sit, what they want to drink, uh, what uh, what hours they're going to be free and available, uh, when they want to eat. You know these things vary like vary from culture to culture, location to location. So, and a lot to with seasons as well. Um, so you've got to factor all these in when you're considering what sort of restaurant or menu to create. So a lot of these factors will influence, you know, the customer's preference. So, uh, you know, let's say, like I was talking about before, um, if they're from, let's say, a predominantly Islamic background, you wouldn't want to be selling non-halal items. So. So essentially, when we're trying to create that customer group, we're looking for what sort of age range they are, how much will they be spending, you know, what sort of gender, you know, how many times a week do they come out, you know, like what sort of level of income do they have, their social, religious background, what their eating habits are, what their buying habits are. So we're looking at all of these things and those factors are really important. 
Um, so food preference, dietary requirements, if they have any special requirements such as maybe a lot of the area is a destination like a you know a tourist destination so you would maybe find a lot of functions are done in your area you might have small weddings big weddings birthday parties so are you gonna have to cater to that are you gonna get those requests so if you are you will have to create menus for that um, if you're going to be creating a seasonal menu then you've got to think about how to adjust that menu to your customers so if you're customers are you know Islamic again or let's say if they're, if they're Jewish so then you might think about okay um, you're thinking about kosher items all right then what are they uh, really seasonal eaters or do they want the same type of dish that makes them feel comfortable okay do that do they want it six months out of the year do they want it 12 months out of 12 months or do they want it only at special holiday time so you've got to think about um, if I'm going to include this in my item is the price gonna vary from time to time you know mangoes uh, are they gonna be expensive in the winter and really well and cheap in the summer so you're gonna be creating a menu item that's going to vary in price you know during season to season so you got to think about those things and also think about your location so if you're um, around a lot of people that means you know most of your business will be local but let's say if you're at a destination a lot of your customers will be travelers and they won't be local so you've got to really guess at that point what they really want to eat so now you've got to make it really general the menu items have to be general because you're not trying to just hit one demographic you're trying to hit every demographic so you can make the most money at your location so there's so many things to factor in when you're creating a menu okay so what are the different characteristics of customer groups so we talked about it um, location income where they you know whether they eat certain sorts of meats or they enjoy uh, certain sorts of beverages like alcohol beer uh, if they've got religious and um, eating habits such as you know maybe they have preferences such as being um, lactose intolerant things like that uh, list some food preferences that customers may have like I said you know nut free uh, gluten free you're thinking about um, you know a set menu style where you've got all the individual items for one person maybe you know they want a deal and you know they walk you know they're trying to get from A to B so they're not too busy uh, oh so they are busy so they're not you know they don't have too much time to sit down and actually have a meal on a plate you know they want it handheld they want to be able to move things like that consider those things write them down once you guys have completed those questions unpause the video and then we can move on to the next one okay hopefully you guys have been able to finish those let's go on to the next so we're going on to 2.1 generate a range of ideas for menus for dishes or food production ranges assess their merits and discuss with relative personnel so you really want to be discussing with the people that are going to be involved day to day and you know and the ones that have the stake in it you also want I would say also involve potential customers you know on on you know how they're going to be paying what sort of price range they're looking at things like that you know um, so this will affect the ideas that you have moving forward <coughs> so the li the ideas for your menus you've got your menu l types listed there so if you're thinking about okay am I you know am I gonna go with an a la carte menu okay great so now you're enabling that customer to make choices so this is really good and really bad at the same time if you've got minimal staff it's very difficult to have an a la carte menu with one chef right unless you're having pre-made food such as a buffet then you've got the chef he's cooking all the food and it's placed in the front of the, uh, the customers and they can choose what they want and they're happy to be there so 
Uh, cyclical, like I was saying before, when you've got the cyclical menu, you've got to be thinking about, okay, I'm going to have a rotating amount of food. It's always going to be changing. So how am I going to set it up? So if you're going to have a lunch, breakfast, dinner, you know, establishment, you're going to have to prepare items based on the timing. So you might have a, a breakfast menu that's available between, let's say, 6 a.m. to 10 a.m. Then you might have a, a lunch menu that's available from 11 to 4, and then five, and then you have a dinner one that's available from uh, 5 till, let's say, uh, 10. So. Depending on that, you'll be creating all these menu items, which you'll have to cycle through. Your staff will have to cycle through. You'll need a lot of people, but well, you know, not not just one, but a lot of people to go through that. Depending on how many items you have, um, money-wise, if you're pre-making food, you've got to be careful on not making too much, so you're not creating too much waste. So it's it's very uh, complex in the sense of how you're going to be making money if you're prepared to make. A big menu you've got to be prepared to spend big um, I like to you know the easiest way to go is having a set menu so you know what you're going to be cooking every day and the customers all they have to do maybe you only give them three options where they've got a set level of items in those options and all they go okay I want number one and they've got um, you know like McDonald's does they've got three staple burgers you know one chicken um, you know, one with fish and one with beef, and then they know they're going to sell chips with it, they know they're going to sell uh, drinks with it. So they're just going to say, oh, I want deal one, deal two, or deal three, and you know all you've got to do is have these three staples together and just switch between. So you're not as switching between buns, you know, you've got the same buns for everything, all you're thinking about, okay, I'm just going to put uh, my chicken into the bun, I've got the same salad, same sauces, everything else, fry the chips, Put the drinks in there, set them out. You know? Alright, so the others, you've got your seasonal and the table to hoot. Uh, you, you know, you've really got to figure out um, if you're really interested in doing that. Um, so if you are, you've got to be able to change as you go through. And it, it does give you more inspiration as a chef. You're allowed to stretch your legs a little bit but you are putting a lot of confidence in your customers to come back and be willing to accept change so if you are you know and your customers are good I think those are really good um, menu styles to do if your customers are adventurous so you'll be making money and you'll be able to kind of mathematically um, you know get better profits and um, because you'll be able to see that what what are your margins so um, if the, let's say this week capsicum is expensive you might just uh, figure out another menu item which would have been you know much more affordable with your budget and create a dish around that compared to capsicum this week or this season so it's a lot more financially stable in that sense where if you've got a budget you can follow that between the seasons Okay, so, alright, so now, so when discussing it with uh, the relevant people, it's really important that, um, you know, you listen and, of course, take on their input because they're going to be involved day to day. Let's say, uh, you know, they know themselves better than you. If you've got a sous chef, if you've got a kitchen hand, they'll know what they're good at and they can tell you you know um, if you've got an, a business owner that you're working with an entrepreneur then ultimately they want money but this also represents them um, a lot of restaurant owners do it not just to make money but because they enjoy it so you know if they're not really enjoying the food that you're making they won't be connected to it so you want to find a connection um, so you know talking to employees um, asking potential customers what they want if you know if they're not really connected you might not be able to sell Russian food in a predominantly um, Indian area like Harris Park where they're looking for Indian food which you know may be multi uh, 
you know, state-based, you know, it could be South Indian, um, you know, from the center somewhere, or, you know, you've got your street food, all those type of foods, but if you're going to bring in a Russian restaurant, and they, it might not have a lot of success, but, you know, you've got to weigh it out. Um, is the area changing? Is there an influx of mig uh, migrants that are Russian? And that you are ne and you're needing to cater for, and they're missing that, you know, n that homegrown Russian style of cuisine. So you've got to do that research, and when you talk to them, and you'll find out what you really need to do. So, and another thing too, talk to your local council, see what sort of, um, because they all know the statistics. They'll be able to tell you these are the sorts of people that live in our area. So you'll you'll know, okay, um, if we're in Bankstown. Um, I've got a large Arab um, clientele, okay, I've got to do Arabian food, biryanis and um, kebabs and sheiks and all those kind of things. So talking to council, your Bureau of Statistics, it will help you with kind of narrowing down what you really want to do in that area. Alright, so activity 2A, so what is a menu? So in my definition, a menu could be any form or any method of communication, most preferably on a piece of material, uh, cardboard, paper, whatever it might be. It could be digital as well. But just so where people know that you're communicating what you're trying to sell to whom you're trying to sell it to. So this could be up on the board somewhere, up on the wall, on a piece of paper, on a... Um, iPad, but as long as it's communicating the items, it's telling what it consists of, what the prices are, uh, if there are special instructions that come with the item, things like that. So this menu is really like an instructional booklet, it's like a manual, it's a price book, everything in one. Okay. What about, um, you know, when we're looking at uh, the different types of menus provide a short description of what they are so maybe we go and you know look at what your a la carte menu is where people are able to pick out different items from your menu or a set menu where people uh, you know don't really have a choice and they produce uh, a certain amount of dishes and they eat them and they essentially are just paying you afterwards um, and moving forward So when you're ready, um, write these uh, the answers down and then move forward. So when you've completed the questions, unpause the video, come back and we can move to the next one. Okay, so hopefully you guys have at least written down three menu types and given me a description about what menus are. Alright, so let's move on to the next one. Choose menu items to meet customer preferences. Um, identify organizational service styles and cuisine and develop suitable items so this is really about thinking about your customer what are they gonna buy and then transferring that into your uh, kitchen so if you're thinking about okay I'm gonna do Indian food okay I'm gonna serve naan but if you've only got a four burner in your kitchen it's not going to be suitable to say I'm going to be selling naan without a tandoori oven in your kitchen so you've really got to be thinking about what you have available to you is it going to be too expensive to maybe order in some special equipment or is it possible to change up how your kitchen is structured and what your menu is currently like and is it possible for you to change it and bring in new customers so you really have to weigh up the options is buying a three thousand dollar tandoori oven profitable for you uh, compared to, you know, maybe thinking about just doing curries and breads of where you can purchase the breads and you would make the curries and rice yourself and you would serve, you know, pre-made breads at a lower price compared to maybe having to hire a skilled person that knows how to make tandoor breads, buying the equipment and then having to you know, create that um, regularity with your customers so that you can pay that staff member to be on 
permanently and then you can have that item on your menu permanently so you've got to think about those things so choosing menu items and service styles before choosing menu items like I said before think about what sort of customers you're going to be serving um, think about <coughs> whether the style of cuisine will be beneficial to your kitchen you know, plan out everything make sure uh, if you've got um, previous inventory what can you use from there uh, moving forward maybe to create new dishes um, but you know you want to be able to use what you've got and then move forward to make newer things think about what sort of style your restaurant is you don't really want to be mixing the two you know Mexican food is very colorful very bright you but you might not want to have a really dull restaurant you might want to suit the theme and go for a uh, bright decor um, and really match the two so when you're thinking about maybe creating the menu, think about what your customers are willing to pay and how can you create an item that adjusts both where your business is still profiting, your customers are being able to purchase that item and it's something that you and your team are able to make. So you've got to consider all those factors. Choosing menu items and service styles, um, you know, different service styles you got Chinese service banquet service buffet style service silver service um, buffet is kind of the easiest but the most um, hazardous in the form that yes you can have cross-contamination between items especially if you're not um, watching your customers you know they could be putting hands in there not using the right spoons maybe they don't want to so they're really being careless where you have to kind of step in and it does kind of create a dynamic where you have to be the bad guy you know you might be saying uh, please do this or hey buddy can you not um, take the curry spoon into the rice spoon <laughs> um, yeah it's kind of ruining that rice so some people understand some people don't so it can get kind of cloudy alright so then we're having to consider whether the you know um, do you have enough staff for such as like the silver service where you've got to have essentially a waiter serving every customer food so which does become more expensive is that kind of something that your customers are willing to pay for if not there's no point in creating a style and culture in your restaurant where it's not actually profitable to you and it's actually doing you harm um, you could do Chinese service where it's kind of the opposite way of the traditional Western service of serving the sweets first, so desserts, and then moving backwards to you know your main meals and soups and all those kind of things. Um, you know, doing banquets can work, especially for um, businesses such as catering. You know, you don't really need to have if you are a caterer, you don't really need to have full-time staff. Um, of the service staff so that really opens it up for you to have casual people coming in to just do service maybe once a week so you're not having to have them on your book so they could walk around when you've got a wedding or a party and serve the customers the potential customers your food so you know when you're doing banquet service you're really trying to think about what can be handheld uh, and essentially portable you know they can eat while they're standing um, and maybe when they're sitting down you know you've got a large spread of food where everything's out at the same time and then they're just assisting so as something finishes they'll bring it out and it kind of, it's kind of helpful in a manpower way where maybe you as the chef will have more time to prepare things compared to a normal restaurant where everything has to be ready uh, you know essentially on the spot compared to where you're doing a banquet maybe you can pre make some of the items so thinking about this is very important as well alright so developing suitable items like I've been talking about the whole time speak to your customers ask them questions what is important for them what allergies do they have do they have dietary requirements are they will they be happy to pay for X or Y and um, you know what is their price range talk to your you know business partners or your business owners or whoever's involved see what they're comfortable with what their margins are what they want out of this business 
maybe you know you're feeding the homeless so there's no really um, not a need for profit there if you're working for a food bank but if you're working for a private company or a business they really want to make money so you've got to think about how do I make the most money without disappointing my customers and them feeling like they've been cheated so you have to find that middle ground okay and you've also got to be thinking about okay what sort how can I make it creative even though it's kind of the same old boring thing so you've got to change it up maybe presentation wise are people looking at presentation or maybe they're looking at quantity or you know so you've got to spice it up a little bit what makes you different from the guys across the street you got to think about that all right so designing menus you know think about what your standout kind of factors will be will it uh, you know be photos will it be item descriptions will it be the pricing what matters to you okay also make sure it's easy to read maybe your fonting is uh, not correct for the demographic if you're around a retirement home most likely your menus will have to have bigger fonts compared to maybe if you're near a primary school canteen where most kids will have good eyesight and they can read smaller fonts so you've got to be thinking about that. Make sure you also put things into categories and not just jumble up everything. You know, so it kind of makes it easier for people to navigate through the menu. So, you know, traditionally you might go entree, um, you know, soups, main meals, desserts, drinks, and so on and so on. So it depends on how many types of food you have, but if you break it down into categories, it makes it easier for the customer to read. Um, be descriptive but not too descriptive where it's an essay you don't want them to waste time and get bored and then not really be interested in the food find the specific things that you want them to know what you know what is in it okay what can they be allergic to uh, what spice rating th things like that so enable your customers to make as much choice as possible without them steering away from the item so they will be able to make a purchase make it as easy as possible for them to make the purchase and be happy with it okay include photos or include color on the menu things like that whatever you think will you know make the sale possible okay all right so we're on to 2b we're th talking about the service styles and a short description so like I was talking about before we've got the silver service with waiters you know serving from the left to the customers you know it, it kind of is expensive but depending on your kind of budget and how your area or your customers are wanting you could go for it um, but it is a higher ticket kind of entry point for your customers so you, you really got to be confident on that there's like Chinese service depending on what type of cuisine you're doing it could be very beneficial to you so you can think about where you are if you're a, a what sort of company you are you could go for a um, you know banquet style buffet style depending on if you're a caterer you know if you'd really cater to the customer at their location so it varies from person to person so just give me a um, you know detail those types of styles give me a description of what they are and then let's move on to the next one uh, how would you develop a suitable and effective menu so we had those dot points there before so it's really I want you to explain how you would go through it you know talk talk about the process what you're going to be doing uh, you're going to be talking to your customers the people that are involved in the business the people that are involved in the kitchen look at what sort of equipment you have and then think about what sort of pricing the customers are able to uh, approach maybe twenty dollars is too much maybe ten dollars feels like it's too cheap so you might go for a fifteen dollar entry item compared to let's say when you're in the city and people are going there for a special occasion and thirty dollars doesn't seem that much to them so you've really got to figure out where you're located and then you got to figure out what you're going to sell what sort of people you're going to hire and thinking about all those things and then sitting down with them and then sharing ideas to what you think you'll be able to sell what you think you'll be able to make the most money from if you are a business that's trying to make money if you're a business or if you're a non not non for profit you know you've got to think about okay how do I feed the most amount of people in the best budget possible 
you know, how do I stretch the dollar so I can feed the most amount of people on the day? So there's various factors, but just detail your step-by-step -step process to make an effective menu. And then you've got to think about, okay, how should my menu look like? Sizes, fonts, pictures, uh, descriptions, and positioning of the menu. Uh, if it's a trifold menu or is it a booklet, you know, you just got to think about how you're going to make the sale and what the easiest process will be to do that. All right, so once you guys have written down your answers for that, um, come back to the video, unpause it, and we'll go on to the next one, okay? Okay, so hopefully the one and two are done. You've written about your menus and how they should be kind of created and what things you're going to consider, and then the short descriptions of the service styles. Just, you know, finish. Hopefully we're finished there. Let's move on to the next one. We've got 2.4. Include a balanced variety of dishes or food production items for the style of service and cuisine. So we've got to really be thinking about the food that we're going to be serving. It can't just be one sort of kind of sweet, 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 sweet. You know, if it is, then you're like narrowing the type of menu that you have to just one sort of item. So then there's not much choice. So let's say if you're an ice cream shop, you are really um, going to have a hard time trying to keep your business open in the winter. But in the summer, you're going to be smashing it. So to counteract that, maybe you have a cappuccino stand, you know, a coffee machine, and you've got a list of drinks to uh, kind of counterbalance the cold things that you have on your menu such as your ice creams so then you've got okay both season you're considering okay when it's gonna be cold I'm gonna be selling the uh, the caf the coffees and cappuccinos and the toasted um, uh, croissants or whatever and then it's when it's um, summertime I'm gonna be selling fresh juices and uh, ice creams and gelatos it just You've got to be smart about how you want to run your business and who's going to be coming to your location. Okay, so think about what's going to be the most appealing and what sort of venue do you have? Do you have a buffet setup? So now having to go into your restaurant um, with a buffet and you're telling me that you want to have um, a la carte menus now, which is great, but now your buffet in the front of your restaurant will be empty which would essentially kind of confuse pr customers from the previous, you know, business owner who, you know, might have sold buffet items for 20 years and their regular customers coming back and they're used to seeing the buffet. So if you haven't changed the current style of your venue, it's going to be really hard for you to change your menu without doing that. So think about how you're going to be um, catering to kids, adults. Um, the elderly, people with special dietary requirements, diabetes or um, lactose intolerance, things like that. All right. So when we're having a balanced dish, we need to really consider the colors. You know, we want it to be bright, or do we want it to be dull? And what what needs to be dull? What needs to be bright? and how we're going to be plating it on the dish or in the box so you've got to think about okay if I'm going to be serving an item that requires a, a packaging where the crispy fried chicken doesn't get soggy you will have to do the research on figuring out okay what takeaway box or container can I put the fried chicken in so it doesn't get soggy compared to let's say if I'm going to be creating rice I don't want to give it in a paper packet um, where it essentially just gets stuck to the paper packet and you won't be able to give it to the customer where they'll enjoy that experience. Think about the cooking methods, what is available to you. Like I said before, you don't want to be putting naan on the menu and not have a tandoori oven or anybody with experience on doing that. Um, delicacies, you know, things like oysters, really popular around the bay, the harbour areas where they are fresh, fresh fishermen are collecting them and giving them to you or you're buying it from a, a fish market and having those things there. 
Um, you know, you've got your caviars and scallops and things like that. Um, and if it is kind of financially um, possible for you, if if it's not an item that is making money, there's no point including that in your menu. Flavors, do they complement each other? There's no point having a um, Italian pasta dish and a tikka masala on the same menu where they do not mix. So think about mix and matching. Okay, if I thought about it, I could have, um, let's say, biryani, which is still Indian, mix of, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, Arabian kind of flavors, but I could also have maybe um, a little bit of um, fried chicken there. So it, it really depends on what's available to you in your kitchen and who's buying. Are they willing to buy those things together or are they going to be still buying it but separately consuming those things? Presentation uh, depends on your type. Again, what do you have in your kitchen and, or what are you willing to buy? If you've been serving things in takeaway boxes and you don't have any plates, you know, there's no point in taking photos of plates but then serving them in uh, plastic containers to your customers. Um, think about what sort of textures they will have, you know, soft, crunchy, uh, smooth, or, you know, kind of thick. Think about mixing and matching the textures and the colors and the consistency, okay? So the better you do those things, the more experimental you can be, and your customers, if they are, you know, kind of adventurous, will be more appreciative and they will come back as if one week they might be able to get Arabian food and next week they might be able to get Indian food and the following week they might be able to get Mexican food. So you might have customers that are returning on a weekly basis for your you know, rotational kind of menu style where you are trying to do different things and you're bringing them back because they enjoy the type of food that you're creating and they're really trying to you know, eat what you've made and not necessarily what sort of cuisine that is being made there but more about what you are taking kind of the leap and the jump on so um, and now let's move on to 2c why is it important to offer a balanced variety of dishes you know you've got to cater to as much people as possible you want to make them much you know as most money that can you can take out from their pocket so think about um, dietary requirements age groups, what they're interested in, the seasons, your location. So depending on all of these, you'll be able to create a menu where, okay, most of my people are beachgoers. What do beachgoers want? Something cool because they've been hot all day. Okay, but in the winter, what up? Okay, they've come to the beach for a walk. They're covered up. Okay, they want a coffee, a hot coffee, things like that. Think about the menu. Okay. All right, list some of the ways to include a balanced variety of dishes into the menu. We talked about this just a minute ago. So, um, you know, think about the colors. Think about um, if it's possible for the cuisine, if it makes sense. Can it be mixed and matched? Um, also, is it uh, nutritionally, uh, you know, is it something that counterbalances what you're kind of selling. Is it the salad to the fried chicken so that you can offer them both together where you can say, oh, you've got um, a two, you know, half of fried chicken. You can also take the salad and a water. And then you can have the alternative and say, okay, you can have chips with a burger and a soda. So having those alternatives will allow you to grab more customers instead of having one certain kind of specific dish okay so put down your answers for those ones in your learner workbook and then once you're done unpause the video and we'll move on to the next one all right so hopefully you guys have done that let's move on to the next one 3.1 itemize proposed components of the included dishes or pro food production items calculate portion yields and cost for raw ingredients this is really important this is where the money comes in okay if you do your calculations wrong you're gonna be losing a lot of money so we don't want to be doing that okay this is ultimately a business unless you you know even if you're working for a uh, 
not-for-profit organization they still need to make that dollar stretch so if you are essentially doing the wrong calculations creating too much food creating too much waste you're not going to be making a lot of money okay so think about how much you're going to produce what your portion sizes will be how much you're going to sell for what amount of money okay these things are very important all right so when we're doing the calculations we're thinking about you know what things will vary and what things can you keep consistent so things such as grains and um, things that are found locally most times you've got to really think about your location where you are so such as rice um, a lot of the local providers are not really local at all they're purchasing from other um, you know South Asian Central Asia kind of countries and these the, the rice is not fresh you know it's been made a couple of years ago it's been packaged and sent out here so there's going to be a lot of stock of this grain so you're not really having to worry about the the rice prices fluctuating too much in a maybe a three month period but if you think about uh, fresh fruit or vegetables these things will fluctuate according to the season so you, if you're able to adjust it's um, okay for you to price it at a minimum but where let's say if you've got cucumber available for all of your 12 months but it goes up in price at a certain point and goes down in price at a certain point you want to take the price at its highest so when your price goes down you can still make a lot more profit but when the price is at its highest you're still making that consistent profit margin so your business is not at a loss so make sure you do those calculations portion by portion so the best way to do it is actually think about what is your potential um, competition doing okay and if you're trying to match that let's say if they're selling items not not the item itself but the price range so if they have items on their menu around 15 to 18 and you want a standard let's say profit margin of 30 percent um, how would you calculate the um, you know you would need to at least have out of ten dollars you would need to have three dollars put away so now you have you know including all your labor your utilities your rent your food pricing in that seven dollars that you have in your hand um, you know to make your food out of okay so we need to look at the area first see what's working and then based on that price range move forward on creating the menu items okay you can also get advice from you know uh, third parties consultants things like that they could obviously help you but this course is about you doing that not going to someone else and doing it yes if you've got the money do it you know be my guest talk to someone else see what they can suggest to you but potentially this is your job so you need to be able to do this when you go into your career as a chef okay um, talk to your customers see what they want see what foods they want and see if it's possible for you to kind of bring it into their price range so maybe instead of giving um, a chocolate mousse in a one liter container for ten dollars which is not going to be possible maybe you give it to them in a hundred gram container but you charge them three dollars which is more approachable for them so you're essentially making money serving a smaller size and making both parties happy at the same time where they can come in and buy it for three dollars they're happy to and you're not creating a large amount of items that's going to be thrown away at the end of the day okay all right calculating portion yields we've got your kind of formula there okay so when you're going to be um, you know calculating your portion yield you're thinking about the desired yield by the original okay and then the the, rec uh, the recipe conversion factor okay um, so when we're going to be adjusting the yield okay we, we, we essentially gonna put those factors in into that formula and then you'll have your your outcome essentially 
Okay. So ingredients, uh, amount, and your recipe conversion factor, and then you've got your new recipe. So if you're um, thinking about, okay, I initially had one recipe for one serving of chips, you know, you're now you need to serve 10 people, you're just essentially going to be multiplying it by the factor of the, the new recipe conversion factor, okay? Um, so let's get into calculating costs for from raw ingredients. Um, you know, your total cost when you're going to be doing that, you also want to be calculating in your GST, your uh, amount of energy that you spent in your utility bills, going out and getting it, um, the time that you spent, the amount of time your chefs will spend on those things. So it's very important to calculate all those factors into your raw ingredients because the, ultimately they will um, play a big role into your costing. Okay. So where, um, what is an itemized list and why is it important to do this? Itemized list, you're just essentially making a list of things that you will purchase because now you've got a recipe and you are following that recipe step by step but if you don't have those specific ingredients you can't follow the recipe so itemized lists are very important to keep you organized keep you on time when you're going outside to purchase ingredients you know keeps you on the ball keeps you moving keeps you moving forward take it off as you go you know what I mean? All right, how would you adjust the yield of a recipe um, essentially we're trying to factor in how much we're going to get like we use the factor, the yield factor we're multiplying or dividing according to um, the amount that we need or we have already and we need to divide it between the amount of people we need to serve so um, we've got the formula there before use that formula give me an example of how you're going to do it and I think that would be the best way to answer this question all right, what will you need to include um, when calculating food costs and pricing menus? Like I said before, the raw food that you're going to be using, the utilities, the time spent, the labor amount that is being used. So there's, there's a lot of factors that you need to think about when you're calculating the cost. Okay, and then you're thinking about on top of that, what is your profit margin? So you're multiplying your profit margin on top of that. So... I always say um, break it down into thirds so 33% of your utilities and labor 33% food costs and 33% profit so that's the bare minimum you wouldn't want to be getting less than 33% out of your menu items because it's not going to be able to um, you know pay the rent and the owner so you really your your job is to make enough money so that the owner can keep continuing and developing the business moving forward okay so answer those questions when you're happy with your answers unpause the video and then we can move on to the next one okay so now 3.3 assess cost effectiveness of proposed dishes or food production items and choose menu items that provide high yield so meaning that give you the most amount for the least amount of money put in and then price menu items to ensure maximum profitability so you want to have the most amount of money made where both the business feels happy and that you know they have made amount of money and that the customers don't feel cheated okay so yes you can make an item out of three dollars and charge a hundred and then make the maximum profit of um, ninety seven dollars and you only sell that item once a week but it's not going to be able to keep the lights on with ninety seven dollars so you want to be able to um, create items that are going to be approachable for customers and where you make enough money for your business to run and create profit okay so cost effectiveness on dishes so you want to assess the cost effectiveness on a regular basis this is very important as you know the costs of items go up and down your gas bill is not going to be what it was in the early 2000s and in, in what it is now so it's going to be increasing everything nothing goes down in price everything goes up um, so you have really got to consider about um, those things that factor into your pricing think about what can you get 
um, the most items from? What has the lowest wastage? Um, items that have a lot of water, when you cook them, they lose a lot of volume because it loses a lot of liquid. But think about maybe if you're selling soup, those items that have a lot of liquid now will transfer into your liquid-based item that you're selling, so you're not losing it. But if you think about, let's say, spinach, um, you are essentially losing air and you're left with something that was only, uh, if, you know, if you've had a large amount of it and you cook the spinach, you've essentially got now this much. So you've got to really think about how you're going to be using it, where you're going to be using it, and how it's going to look at the end of your cooking process to your customers. Okay, so when you're setting prices, it can be difficult. So that's why I like to work backwards. I like to l research my area, see what's working, okay? See the price, the median price between all the customers. So how you find the median price, okay? You look at maybe 10 restaurants that are in the area, okay? See what their most highest menu item is and then what their lowest item is. And then add those together and then divide it by half, okay? So then you'll find the middle ground and see what works best, okay? What is the most popular dish? Just walk into a restaurant and say, hey, uh, I want to order your most popular dish, okay? And if it's being sold like hotcakes, you know it's working. So you know maybe if they're selling, um, let's say, burgers for $16 in the area, then you know you are able to sell a burger for $16. But let's say if in your area people only sell burgers for $8, there is no chance in hell that you're going to be able to sell your burgers for 16 where next door to you they're selling it for 8 So start from that price range and then work backwards. Okay, So then divide... Even if you're working at a 33%, 33%, 33%, take away, if, let's say if your item is $10, take away $3.30, and then try and manage all of those utilities, your hours, your food costs in that 7 or 6, um, 66 that you have in your hand. Okay? So, um, you know, you want to really find that balance between not charging too much not charging too less okay all right so like I said you'll have variable costs someday you'll have a lot of people on the roster someday you'll have very few depending on how much money you're making um, how much marketing are you putting in are you sending out flyers are you using uh, social media ads are you putting ads on the radio all these things have to be factored into your food cost because if it's continuous, okay, let's say you can say, okay, I spent 50 grand on a billboard in the center of Sydney, but you're located in Gosford. That's not really going to make sense. So your marketing has to be effective and most prominent for you and has to work for you. So, and those costs have to be factored into your food. Otherwise, it's a startup cost, yes, but are you going to be continuingly doing that investment? Are you going to be continuingly uh, sending out pamphlets and doing radio advertisements and doing Google ads and things like that? So then you have to add that onto your food price. Uh, obviously we've got the raw ingredients, uh, ingredients themselves, the time that it takes to produce those items. Are you going to be serving it on a package or you've, are you serving it in-house? Uh, are you delivering it or are you uh, customers coming to eat at your location so if you're delivering it you would want to essentially charge a delivery fee on top because that you've got to now hire a person and then have them go from A to B or nowadays most people are using online systems like Uber and uh, DoorDash and things like that so where now you have to factor that in because those companies will take percentages from you so now you're having to think okay they're already taking a 30% cut from my food because they're delivering it, so how do I make money on that at all? So now you have to consider, okay, um, do I increase my food prices? Okay, so there's so, so many, you know, factors that go in, okay, and they'll always be variable. One company might charge you an introductory fee of 20% um, for every order, where another company will say, you know, we're the big guys and you have to pay us 30%. So it varies from place to place. So 
you need to do your research and really set them up so you're not losing money at the end of the day because any product sold you you can justify it the first week and say okay it's an investment that loss is an investment for me because I want the customer to come back because they enjoyed my food but you can't keep continually making a, a loss because that's not a business so consider what you need to make from the business to keep the lights on what your owner wants ultimately if if they're happy making a 10% maybe you have a bit more leeway to lower your entry uh, for the customers so they can purchase the items a bit at a lower scale compared to if your you know business partner or uh, business owner says okay I want to make 30% on each item you've got to now think about how you're going to approach the item you're going to sell okay all right fixed costs um, you know your equipment that's already there rent insurance um, you know some utilities like you know the electricity you know it's going to be there if you're not open then it's fine but you if you're going to be you know having your doors open you need to have your lights on um, you know your uh, you know upkeep for the building your location things like that you need to consider into your pricing okay and then calculating the profits so like I said before you know you should be going for as high as possible and you know figuring out where it works the best consider what your customers can purchase and what your owner or business manager or partner wants okay so they're they're saying to really have the profit margin in that middle spot which I like to say you know 33 33 33 it kinda helps out everybody okay so you know you will have more work there but it's kinda the ideal place to be okay if you're going for higher kind of profit margins yes you will work less but it's unless you've got a really interesting point of sale like that's unique to you it's harder to make that sale to make that purchase so if you're selling the only toast in the world that's shaped like a star yes you can put your prices up but if everybody is selling toast that is shaped like a star now you're having to compete on a price level and a quality level so think about how you can make your business unique as well right so 3b examples of variable costs and fixed costs so essentially make two columns of variable and fixed costs so your marketing you know you've got things that will change with time uh, things that are fixed like your utilities your workers your management you know the things like that so make a list give me five and five each you've got uh, we've talked about it before so just make a list there okay All right. so for number two why is it important to assess the cost effectiveness of the dishes it's very important because ultimately we want to make money from this okay and if we're losing money or there's a lot of waste there's no point keeping that item if it's not going to make us money okay ultimately we might enjoy it but it's not good for our pocket ultimately and the restaurant will close down or the company will close down so we need to make those decisions that we might not be happy with okay so talk about cost effectiveness and why it's important you know what factors really when we find cost effectiveness um, what factors are important to have it be cost effective so and once you have it co being cost effective what it allows you to do you know keep your business going and um, bring in money for your business and the owner and everybody's happy kind of thing All right. Uh, third one, what does break-even point mean? Break-even point essentially is where everything is at a zero. So essentially we don't want to be at a break-even point. We want to be making more than even. We want to make enough money in profit. Okay. So break-even is where you your cost is zero. You're making a, you know all your cost. Let's say is ten, and then you brought in ten. So everybody's getting paid, but there's no profit. So if let's say if you're the owner and you're counting your and you're the chef as well you can achieve a, a break-even point um, and you know if you're working there you can have your labor included and say yes I'm breaking even but that's not a business okay you're working and essentially you're just working for yourself and if you don't go into work you're not making any money 
so you want to be able to make profit so if the day comes where you can't go to work you have some sort of you know nest egg or some a stash of money put away in those profits that you can use to cover those days that you are unavailable okay so break even point like it says in the name it's a point where you reach zero with all your costs and the amount of money that you received and it's kind of like a stable in line in the middle we don't want to be there we want to be making profit okay all right so once you write the answers for these uh, come back to me and we can move forward so pause the video now all right write those answers down in your learner workbook come back when you're ready to move on to the next one all right so hopefully you guys answered the three questions let's move on to the next one 4.1 write menus using words that appeal to customers and your customer base and fit with the business service style so you know uh, you want to use words that are appetizing you know fresh vibrant colorful uh, sweet sour you know things like that that are descriptive and allow people to kind of imagine what it would be like to to try those menu items okay um, when you're writing your menus you know you're not just trying to inform them but you're you're trying to kind of sh show them what your business is like what sort of items you do and what sort of kind of um, ambiance and presence they can kind of expect if they go to your establishment okay so think about really what you want to reflect because if you're sending out these menus to let's say a letterbox drop okay they're not gonna that, that's the first impression okay you don't want to lose them on the first impression okay you don't want to be boring but you don't want to have things that are just hitting from every direction where they go this is too too much I'm not even interested in reading okay so you wanna find that perfect middle ground where it's enough description there's a steady layout that they can follow with different sections and um, a, you know nice descriptions and pricing where they can read it uh, you know not tiny little fonts or uh, having too much in a small package where you now you're trying to fit in too much information maybe you might want to if it is if you have a lot of information to fit maybe you can link it externally include websites and say to find out more go to our website www.com so it's not that important to have everything on there but it's just so that we can get grab their attention we want to be able to um, you know really get them interested in what we're trying to sell so this is our first point of really getting them through the door and we want to have the best impression okay so you know using colors maybe going through the quality of paper that we're sending out all these things really are important okay all right common mistakes like I said before prints are too small the paper being too crowded using too many languages you know if you're trying to trying to show off oh, okay you, and you know you have multiple people in the area you have Arabic Chinese Indian and everything Hindi or sorry uh, you know have all these kind of different languages on there it's not going to be helpful for anyone because now there's too many um, descriptions on there now okay complicated words that might not be easy to pronounce or just not needed um, lack of description so maybe you just put rice that's pretty simple but let's say if you put um, you know a you know people have maybe never had a poppadom before um, it's really important to put that description in there so they know what they're kind of expecting when they come into you inaccurate pricing you don't want to be sending out old menus that have maybe 10 years previous pricing on there and they come to you and they see the price is you know multiple uh, you know instead of it being one dollar on that menu it's now ten dollars and then they're upset they're arguing with you you know they're unhappy okay then we've got you know you want to have those important information on there like your where you're located when you're open what sort of um, 
you know, demographic, you know, if you're a family restaurant, dine in, take away, um, you know, specific places where they can find you, like your website, your social media, and then you've got what sort of maybe payment methods you accept, cash, card, or PayPal, there's so many payment methods nowadays, maybe Bitcoin, you accept Bitcoin, so things like that, okay, you need to express yourself in the neatest and concise form as possible okay so your customers aren't scared away from your business All right so now 4.4 uh, a how would you write an effective menu list some common menu mistakes so effective menu like those points before you want to have it appealing you don't want to have it cluttered um, essentially these two are opposites of each other if you can tell me why your menu is effective um, you can essentially tell me why it's ineffective so the mistakes will be such as um, putting too much information on the book putting too many languages on there um, having incorrect pricing so things like that okay so complete those two questions when you're uh, complete and finalized that come back to the video unpause it and we'll move on to the next one okay so let's move on to the next one 4.2 use correct names for style of cuisine okay very important you don't want somebody expecting to come to a Chinese restaurant and then they come to a burger joint okay so make sure you're, you're explaining yourself well so then when they come here they're not getting something unexpected okay uh, when preparing food for an event or restaurant, you will most likely be preparing dishes for different cuisines. So however a customer may ask you to prepare dishes from a cuisine you are not familiar with, it is important that you are aware of different popular cuisines so you can prepare them and describe them on the menu accurately. So this involves a lot of research. Okay, if you don't know what you're going to be making, you need to do your research. You need to talk to someone who has done it before or who has the experience of it. Okay, so consult them, have them involved in your process, okay? Talk to the customer. What do they want on the menu? Okay, and can you provide that to them? It's all good taking the money, but ultimately if they're not happy, there's going to be issues at the end of the event. So make sure you are involving everyone in that process, okay? Now, when we're talking about cuisine types, there's so many, there's so many. This is just a short list okay uh, Mexican Italian Indian Thai Greek Chinese French Spanish Caribbean there's so many okay any place that you think has a unique style of food that's a style of cuisine so you need to mention it on your menu um, what sort of food you're doing essentially Western uh, Mediterranean whatever 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 you want to say make sure it kind of coincides with what you're selling to your customers okay Alright, so this one's a bit um, very easy. Uh, 4B, list some different cuisines and explain what each one is. Maybe you can give me about three to four and just tell me what you know location they come from, an example of a food. So if you're saying, you know, what is Mexican, you can say quesadilla. Okay, um, you know, what quesadilla is. Uh, if you're t telling me maybe Western modern western food you know fast food okay burgers chips whatever okay so give me three to four give me an ex uh, you know description of what they are and maybe an example okay all right let's move on to the next one why is it important to know about different cuisines well, it's very important as a chef you should be able to know about all these doing the research it's very important for your business let's say you open a restaurant that really focuses on burgers in one location but you might have the f you know fortunate um, chance to open another restaurant somewhere else but there's already burger restaurants there so now you you know you'll have to use your knowledge to maybe open a Thai restaurant so having that knowledge will really help you in the business world as in you know you'll be able to open up more and more restaurants and in more and more different menu styles okay so write that down Write the answers down on your learner workbook. Uh, pause the video so you can do that. Once you're ready, come back and we will move to the next one. 
Okay, so once you've done that, let's go on to the next one. 4.3, use descriptive writing to promote sale of menu items. So we really want to be bringing out the, you know, feeling and the taste and the texture. So you want to be saying crunchy, sweet, soury, things like that, that will really describe what you're going to be selling to people. Um, think about including what they might want to stay away from, okay? So when you're trying to finalize that sale, that menu will help you, okay? Use words such as seasonal and, um, you know, keywords that really hit different, you yeah? um, You've got to be really, it's kind of like a sales pitch. You're, you're trying to sell your products. So you don't want to just say fried in oil, you know what I mean? You know, you want to be, say, you know, want you want to be writing such things as cooked perfectly to a crunchy texture in uh, locally sourced olive oil. You know, there's different ways of saying the same thing, but you want to say it in a way that's more appealing than the other. Okay, so make sure you write it in a way that it kind of conveys the same idea, but in a more appealing way. Okay. All right, so write specific descriptions of food items, explain dishes in a creative way, use the right language, don't, you know, you don't want to be using profanity, you don't want to be using too many words where they get lost and then, then they just get bored of it. Be clear, straight to the point, you know, accurate in what you're trying to sell and use, you know, those, those words, juicy, yummy, irresistible, taste, you know, sensations and crunchy and fluffy, things like that. So that really describe what you're trying to give them. Okay. All right. So 4.4 uh, C. Why is it important to use descriptive writing in menus, and how would you use it? So very important. You want to create a appealing menu that really finalizes that sale. You want to get the customer through the door, and using those descriptive languages and you know kind of creating the imagery for your customer allows them to kind of without even trying your food, kind of imagine how it would be. So now they're looking forward to coming to your place, uh, whether, you know, it might be from miles away or just next door to you. Okay, so you don't have to actually feed them first. So that menu is kind of bringing them to you. All right. Um, list some tips for promoting the sale of menu items. So sometimes um, it can be better to have specific items that really sell or you want to sell in specific locations that are easily accessible by your customer base. So um, there are a lot of restaurants and menu, uh, you know, places that have a really s small and specific uh, menu. So they know what they're going to be selling. They sell those items, you know, majority of the time. But they also have other menu items that are maybe a secret or you can ask the person there and they are willing to show it to you and allow you to pick from a bigger menu but what the smaller menu allows you to do is have a quicker sale time so instead of having 200 items on one menu you may know what your populations are so it might be 20 so instead of your customer reading 200 items that you sell they're only reading those 20 that you want them to buy first and then if they are still not happy with what they have found on your short menu, you may then instruct your waiters or your servers to say, oh, so have you not found what you're looking for? We have a bigger menu that you can go through with more options. So it's kind of making sure you want to have your sale completed as soon as possible. You don't want to take too much time. Um, yes, our business is a lot to do with, you know, sitting, people sitting down, talking and all that. But we don't want to be spending a lot of time talking to them. We want to be moving on to the next customer, making that sale, putting the food on the table, and then they can talk to each other as long as they want. We need to be moving on and making the sale. So as soon as maybe the last sale of the day is gone, we can send the waiter home instead of having to pay them for another hour to try and sell another specific item from a menu that has 200 options okay so think about what you uh, would suggest to somebody else um, you know the tips that you'd suggest when they would be creating a menu for them to promote more sales
okay You're using colors the right amount of fonts things like that okay all right so complete those answers and come back to me unpause the video when you're ready and then we can move on to the next one all right hopefully you guys have done um, a good amount of descriptions there for those two questions let's move on to 5.1 seek ongoing feedback from customers and others and use to improve menu performance so this is really important because these people are the ones giving you money so if you don't really talk to them you know while you have the chance you might never have the chance so some customers yes they can be a pain they can kind of bully you around and that's their nature but most people are good most people if you do have a chat to them they are willing to give you suggestions without being nasty so use that review or feedback to kind of improve where it is lacking um, you know don't be too egotistic and say what you produce from your kitchen is perfect we're not perfect we're not robots to do one task every day exact way uh, one day I might be in a mood to really you know spend a bit more time on a specific item and in another day I might not so it, it just really varies from day to day but you've really got to think about the aspect if the core aspects from your menu items are missing then you know you've got to reassess everything and see is it really important um, you know the you know you you've got to think about how you're doing things and if it's not working out you might need to change the systems okay so is if a item is taking too long to make and it doesn't make too much profit is it really important to keep it on the menu okay so talk it through and it, do customers even want it ask them is this item that I have on the menu doesn't really sell that well do you really want us to keep making it okay or can can we get rid of it and add something different what what different things are you looking for what might you be wanting that we can exchange with one for the other okay so talk to them they'll be able to let you know what they want to buy that's just the easiest way to know what you want to sell to them right they'll tell you okay I want this rice or this pasta or whatever it is and if you've got it they'll buy it from you if they want it All right? so assess success of menus against customer satisfaction and sales data so that's kind of easy if you've got a point of sale you can see what's selling and what's not so at the end of the day you can take the statistics and say okay I'm selling this much of um, cheese and uh, charcuterie on a plate or I'm selling soups or chicken corn soups this amount this month and it's only going up so I can see that it's a popular item and I'm not selling maybe um, a minestrone or a um, or tomato cold tomato gazpacho it's not working in the area so instead of having to throw it out at the end of the week you remove it from your menu create less waste you know it helps everybody and especially you you don't have to make it so it makes your day a bit easier all right so ask them like I said before ask some questions see what's up you know maybe you want to sit down with them your um, your workers your customers the ones that at least want to give you genuine feedback and use that data and see if you can move forward with it okay um, the success of menus see what's happening um, especially you'll be able to see uh, from your sales reports from your point of sale system it'll tell you these items have sold X amount 100 100 chips only 50 um, apple juices and uh, um, 200 cokes so you know your apple juice is not really working out maybe it's better just to keep cokes or maybe you say okay I have water but is water really selling so your computer system will be able to tell you but other than that you've got you know your waiters your chefs everybody involved in the business will be able to tell you what's going what's not where they're spending more money where they're not so talk to everybody involve them in the conversation be open have open meetings so that everybody can contribute and it really helps out every, everybody essentially if you're making more money you can keep everybody on for longer okay all right so 5a we've got list some ways to gather feedback from customers so we got reviews um, holding a focus group talking to them in person and, or getting um, a 
um, like a suggestion box you know things like that so they can be anonymous or using Google reviews online reviews there's so many online review sites that you can use to get feedback okay talk to the customer if you've got connections if you've got their email you know send them a survey okay so there's so many forms that you can use to get feedback from customers all right so give me about four to five then you'd be good to go on that one uh, number two what methods can you use to assess popularity of a menu item yeah uh, you know you can do surveys right use the uh, sales reports uh, popularity index of what's going on you know um, you could also just be uh, you know you can confront the customer and just ask them hi is this menu what you're looking for and how can we um, potentially develop on what we have done now or do we need to throw everything out and start from uh, the beginning so talk about what methods you can use um, give me about one or two and just describe what it should be so once you guys have kind of finished those questions come back unpause the video and we can move forward with the next okay hopefully you've done that we're on 5.3 now so just menus based on feedback and profitability so very important if you're not making money there's no point selling what you're selling so we need to make profit we need to make customers happy okay these two things are very important so when you get the feedback like this is too messy or if your people are saying it's too hard to create this item for not um, the right amount of money you need to remove those items away from your menu okay so first of all yeah why would you adjust the menu you know it shows that you listen to feedback that you you want to improve um, that you're focused on your customer satisfaction rates and you, your customers are important to you uh, you know it helps to increase the profit for your business it helps you keep your business ahead of competition because the competition might not be doing what you're doing they might be really lacking on communication with their customers and you know sometimes over time that does happen so you need to really be above that talk to them see what's up and you can keep moving forward if you have open communication with your customers so uh, you can also show your skills and maybe you've got a new potential uh, worker or a chef you can bring in their skills and have them involved in creating a new item okay so it kind of shows variety and you know most of your customers might get bored about the things that they've already had so they want to try something new okay and you know obviously your business can stay on top and you can involve new food trends and styles and all these things the food industry is always changing and developing and um, there's new creations new technologies so if you you know can figure out how to implement those in your business and your processes um, to a profitable uh, position anyway then it will be only positive moving forward okay so 5b would you need uh, when would you need to make adjustments to a menu especially when it's not working <laughs> obviously um, when you've got feedback about uh, from customers workers and they're not really happy with it um, when it's outdated maybe your cuisine style is outdated and it's not something that's working you know you're losing the attention you're being uh, you're not really uh, creating any interest within your customer base anymore your maybe your customer base has moved on maybe there's somebody new something new and maybe you need to get them back so do something different okay why is it important to adjust and improve menus on a regular basis you know you're keeping yourself fresh you're showing your customers and your workers that you're interested about your business and your customers that you pay attention okay you know you're really wanting your customers to come back and you, you want to be loyal and you you're taking into consideration what you what they're saying to you so all these factors really play a key role on why you would adjust your menu and improve them as you go along and plus you're making more money if you're making more money you know you're gonna have more and more businesses more and more staff more and more customers so um, it's a lot about money at the end of the day if you're not really bringing in the profits it's a bit hard to do anything because you don't have the money to print out a new menu if you're not making money so anyway so write those the um, the answers down to those questions um, pause the video right now 
when you finish writing it in your learner workbook come back and then we can move on to the next one but I, I think this is it though so we will stop uh, once you guys um, write in your learner workbook we will um, move on to the knowledge questions so you'll have a knowledge assessment and then there's another two assessments the uh, performance and skill so don't forget to do your multiple choice questions and complete your learner workbook submit them to your trainer and their associated email as soon as possible so then you don't have to worry about it so get those two things done okay so if you've got any questions you know we've got those skill knowledge and performance assessments as well left um, and if you've got any questions, any feedback or any issues, um, shoot me an email or um, give us a call um, and we can direct you to the best person or your trainer or I can try and get you the best answer possible. Alright, so uh, the email is admin at wisemanneducation.com.au um, If you know your trainer's email, shoot them an email there and they'll be able to help you the best um, possible way. Alright, so I hope you've had a wealth of knowledge from this presentation. Um, go and finish your book, submit it, and then we can go on to the next assessments accordingly. If you need to kind of re-learn things, you can always come back to the video and then just go through it again. Um, you know, if you're tired of me talking so much, pause it, come back, go back and forth a little bit so you don't have to listen to me for an hour and a half talking to you. Alright? Catch you guys later.